um, this series is called Changing the Climate. And the aim of it is not sometimes when we come to church or we hear a message, there's a sense of literally just because I'm standing above you, speaking over people's heads. And, and so people, it's like they examine it and it goes over their heads and they're like, oh yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah, like uh, that, that, was, that was a good message or, or uh, my, my least favorite compliment, that was a lovely message because, because I know people are trying to be encouraging, but sometimes I don't want it to be, I want it to be fiery. I want it to be challenging, not, oh, that was lovely. I'm like, I was speaking on the end times. No, um, but, <laughs> but you know, for this, messi- for this series, we wanted to really impart a sense of who we are as a church, but also who we want to be, because we acknowledge that this is a, a really good church, but there's more that God wants to do. And last week's message on generosity, that it actually there'll be individuals and groups of individuals that say, I don't want to just... Um, dabble in being generous. I want our whole church, I want our ministry, I want our small group to be a generous small group. I want this to become the shape of who we are. And um, this morning, I'm speaking about how do we change the climate of the way we engage with the culture outside the walls of this church. I think often people say, oh, you know, um, the question is not, do you engage with the broader culture outside you know, in, in the world? Everyone engages with culture. Even if you switch off the internet, even if you switch off your TV, even if you live in your house like a hermit majority of the time, you are still engaging with culture. The point is, if you're doing all those things, if you're cutting off from people 24-7, you're just not engaging with your culture very well. And as a church, the question is not, do we engage with that culture? It's how healthy are we as a Christian community here at the Christian Family Center at Seton? How well are we engaging with the broader culture around us? I think there's also an acknowledgement that for some people just to come to church, and you might be a guest here this morning, and what I'm going to say is going to make you want to stand on your chair and say hallelujah, because you understand what I'm saying. For some people just coming to church, it is like walking into another world, and you are just freaking out. When people come to church for the first time, I always say to them, so how did you enjoy it? I don't assume that they've loved it because I generally assume that when people have come that have never been to church before, they're generally a little bit freaked out because you have men singing and it's not, you know, the theme song of their sporting team. And you have people raising their hands and you have people kind of being very serious and you have someone standing up on stage preaching at people. I mean, you know, like it's, it's an unusual environment. And, and so I say, so, it was you know, a little bit different to what you expected? And they go, yeah, just a little bit. And we trust that the good news of Jesus will impact people's hearts. We trust that we also find that people that come to church that haven't been before, often they are overwhelmed by a sense of the presence of God in the worship, even if they can't identify it. Whereas Christians tend to pick things apart and yeah I like that song yeah I'm not exactly a fan of that song Uh, uh, you know the drums are a bit loud or whatever whereas people from the outside come in and they might be like wow I don't know what that was but I felt warm or I felt like I belonged or or I felt different or I felt challenged or I felt uplifted and so but for some people to come into a Christian community like this we often think that we don't have a culture we're just yeah we're just we've got the culture of Jesus yeah right we wish we have some really healthy culture in our church. We have some really um, not so healthy culture, just like any other community. And so for some people to come to our church community or to go to your connect group or to go to your ministry, it might be the equivalent of me going to, I don't know, like a rave. I was watching Four Corners last week. They were doing like an expose into the rave, like dance party culture. And I'm just watching it. And these people that go dancing all night, I'm like who's got the energy for that? And, and I'm not a big fan of doof doof music at the best of times. And if I went to a rave, like, you know, like, and, and they're, uh, they're showing the, the footage of people, you know, they're, they're handing around the pills and stuff. And, and I just thought, honestly, for me, that's such a foreign environment. And it would be quite confronting. Um, and whereas, and I think it's just acknowledging 
that when there's a clash of cultures, sometimes we recluse and we react and we, we huddle with what we know. So the question is not, do we engage our culture? It's how effective are we being? Ed Stetzer um, says this, we can't engage evangelistically. And anything, when you hear the word evangelistically, the root of the word evangelism is uh, euangelion, which is gospel, good news, well news. And so whenever we are grappling with evangelism, we're, we're, we're doing the business of communicating good news. Not the good news, not good advice, but the good news of what God has already done in Christ. His life, His death, His resurrection. So we cannot engage evangelistically with the gospel going out to people by going along with the culture. By just going along with everything in the prevailing culture, whether it be in media, whether it be in school, whether it be in university, whether it be in work, whether it be in trends. If we just go along with that wholeheartedly, we cannot engage evangelistically, but also we cannot engage effectively without living in the culture. And some Christians try to extract themselves from the culture and they can never engage or connect with people effectively. You see, Jesus is perfect theology. Jesus is the perfect picture of what, of not only of who God is, but also who, who human beings should be. And so when we have that profound statement in John chapter 1, verse 1, that the eternal Son of God, the Word, became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. It's, it's significant. If I was God and I had to come on a rescue mission, I would come to earth as an angelic figure that appeared human so that I did not lower myself to being prone to physical conditions or or, or temptation. But no, no, no. God, the eternal Son, enfleshed Himself. He became flesh with all of its brokenness and limitations and dwelled amongst us. And He expressed His divinity in a human body. Wow. That'll mess with your head for a bit. And so... And so that is the model of God living in, like He literally came to be with and in the culture of people that are broken and lost, yet He did not compromise His mission. He did not compromise His calling. He did not compromise His values. In fact, Jesus said, I have not come to abolish but to fulfill the law. What does that mean? It means that He perfectly lived out the law of the Old Testament. Wow. So, I want to read a passage that gives a picture as to what we're meant to do, how we're meant to engage culture as Christians. And then I'm going to give another passage that seems to contradict it. Because I like it when the Bible contradicts, because generally it gets us to think. And it's not contradicting, but it just, it's, we live in the middle of some um, some sweeping statements. And most Christians gravitate towards one of these two extreme approaches. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And this is the Apostle Paul, and he's, um, he writes this, Though I'm free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. That's ex- extreme language. I'm exla- enslaving myself to win others. I am going to put my own agenda aside to win other people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like those under the law, though myself am, am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm weak under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become, this is key, all things to all people. Can you say that? All things to all people. How many people know that it's really tiring being all things to all people? So that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all for the, for the sake of the gospel that I might share in its blessings. You see, Paul is saying, even though I'm not a slave to anyone except for Christ, I make myself a slave to these things. I do things physically. I do things emotionally. I do things with my time. I do things with my priorities for the sake of people. I don't compromise my values. I don't compromise my beliefs. And when you hear about Paul's life, when you read about Paul's life, he was a man that was really committed to living a holy life, really committed to living out the teachings of Jesus and the Old Testament Scriptures. Yet he is saying, I am willing to basically jump through hoops so that I can reach people that are different to me. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. He went where no one else was willing to go. 
other people could find an excuse for not speaking to that person or that person or that group or that group. Whereas Paul said, I am called to go to them and I'm willing to count the costs. But I think sometimes we can just think, you know what? Yeah, yeah, I just need to do what it takes for pe- to win people over. And we can drift towards what um, some people would call down the path of syncretism. And syncretism is when you become so much like the culture or the people that you surround yourself that you actually become indistinguishable from them. For instance, imagine if someone outside of our Christian community came to your connect group and they listened to the way you spoke, they looked at the way you prioritized your life, they looked in a new group and they could not tell that you are any different from any other group in society, whether it be a sporting club or a special interest group. Wouldn't that be a tragedy if people looked in on your life and they could not see that you were different? In fact, you would become so much like, whether it be your family, whether it be your sporting club, whether it be your workplace, that people were surprised when they found out you were a Christian. I remember when I used to work at McDonald's, I remember being so disappointed one day. And I was pretty immature and pretty naive, but I remember finding out. I was craving to find a Christian ally in my workplace at McDonald's. They gave me the nickname, The Holy Man, because I went to church, um, not because I preached to people, and it kind of stuck So it was like, hey, man, this is the holy man. Don't spray around him. I'm like, no, no, it's okay. You can just relax. Don't tell people that. And they're like, no, no, don't swear around him. Don't say, oh, my God, around him. And so I got this reputation, even though I didn't really want it. Anyway, I was looking for an ally. I was praying for an ally. And then after about one year, I realized that one of these guys I'd been working for for a long time was a Christian. But I could not tell by the way he lived. And he was really involved in his church. He was really involved in his youth ministry. But I tell you, it really broke my heart because I felt like I'd been let down. And I felt like he had not had an impact in that workplace because he was not willing to be called a holy man like me. You see, I I know so many many people, and we often say, oh, young people. Yeah, that's so true of young people, isn't it, today? After the first service, someone said, yeah, that's this stuff about church and culture, yeah, and how culture impacts us. Yeah, it's so true of young people. And I just always say, no, it's true of all people. We often like to point the picture at young people, but young people are just people that haven't got as stuck in their ways as what you have. Like, it, it's amazing. I hear Christians say, I don't want to be different. I don't want people to think that I'm a dot, dot, dot. Just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I can't dot, dot, dot. And we actually don't want to be different. And every now and again, I've chatted with a number of people in this church and they've said, oh yeah, I just don't want to be that guy, that Christian guy that people think is different. I'm like, well, you are a Christian. Hopefully you think that you are different because of the whole blood of Jesus thing and the whole forgiveness thing and the whole grace thing. Hopefully you want to say, yeah, I'm not better, but I'm different. You know, um, over the years, as many years as a youth pastor, I've chatted with so many young people that have said, oh, I just feel called. You know, I just really want to go with my friends and I want to go to, to nightclubs and, and just impact my friends for Jesus. And I'm like, yeah. And I, I have to say, honestly, in all of my years, I actually know two people, two, that have been really effective missionaries in the nightclub scene. One um, girl back in Sydney, and she'd go to nightclubs and she would kind of go there. She, she enjoyed the music and she'd go into the toilets and she'd, she'd pull girls' hairs, hair back from their face that, as they were being sick. And she'd wait out and, 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 and uh, make sure girls got into cabs safely outside the club and make sure if they were being sick in the gutter after, after clubbing all night. And she literally saw herself as a missionary um, to the nightclub scene and she loved dancing as well. And, um, and an, another girl um, who, who actually was here in our church for a while, Lucy, similar, really feels called to the nightclub scene. She was telling me about um, in London, she goes to these nightclubs and she just walks around the club the whole time just praying. And she just prays and she just prays for God to bring people across her path that she can minister to. And it's, but for, for those two people, I have had chats with dozens and dozens of dozens of other people. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I sure feel like God wants me to go to nightclubs. Like, really? Let's, let's, let's have a chat about what that's doing to you or how that's helping your life or what fruit that's producing in your life. And, I, and so I think we, 
the answer is not always legalism, but sometimes we can drift so much towards syncretism, just becoming like everyone else, that we lose our convictions in the process. Here's another passage that the Apostle Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This is just where Paul likes to mess with our head because he's writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians and he seems to be looking at it from a, di- a very different angle. Don't be yoked together with unbelievers. Uh, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what, fellowship, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, and God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. When I was a teenager, I highlighted this scripture in my Bible. This was in fluoro green. And the come out and be separate, for me, I was in a Christian school where a lot of my friends were hypocrites. They said they were Christians that they weren't. And for me, it was a fundamental call to be different. And, and there is a call to be different as Christians. Right throughout the Old Testament scriptures, one of the primary calls of the people of God is that you are my chosen people. I will be your God. You will be my people. We just read that. It's got echoes throughout the Bible, right throughout Old Testament and New Testament. And as the people of God, they are called to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. They are called to be different. And this is not some ethnic superiority. The people of God in the old, God didn't just say the Jews are ethnically superior to every other race. God is not racist like that. But God said, I am going to call a people and I'm going to rise them up so that that all the nations of the world will see their justice, see their mercy, see their love and justice, see their care for the poor, see that they are different, see that they rely upon the Lord God of Israel and all the nations of the world will be jealous and be drawn to that God. And the nations of the world will be drawn to repent and to change their ways. And so it was always about God's missionary spirit desiring to draw the nations of the world to the worship of the one and only God, the God of Israel. And you so, and, and see, um, right throughout history, Christians have got this wrong. We've thought God wants us to be different, but we often think, well, well no, God, wants, God thinks we're better. Or God doesn't want us to be tarnished by the the pollution of the culture of the world. See, the early Christians were radical in their holiness. They were radical about what they believed about Jesus. They were willing to die for it, but they were also willing to go where no other people were willing to go and being the hands and feet of Jesus and touching people in real life. That's how they turned the world upside down. And so while some Christians can drift towards um, syncretism, becoming just like everyone else and losing our distinctiveness, other Christians, and some of us, we can drift towards sectarianism. We extract ourselves from environments that clash with our values. We only spend time talking with people who agree with us. Do you ever think, oh, am I going crazy? Everyone I talk to agrees with me on this subject, but, you know, everyone I agree with, everyone, you know, I talk to agrees with me that Pauline Hansen should be Prime Minister. Why? Why don't the polls reflect this? Is it because everyone that you talk to is just like you? Why doesn't everyone agree with me that Sarah Hansen Young from the Greens should be the Prime Minister? Well, it's because everyone that thinks that Sarah Hansen Young should be Prime Minister has a very similar worldview to you. And from time to time, dare I say, we need to get out of our little insular boxes and realize that there are other people that have different worldviews to us. And we're convinced that we're right and we're suspicious of other people that have different views to us. You know, one of the things, the, the worst things, if we become suspicious of everyone, we, and, and we, we're so convinced of how right we are, we actually build up walls around ourselves and we don't build bridges with people. And you see, the thing I love about Jesus, Jesus didn't walk around being suspicious of anyone's motives except for those that put themselves on a religious high ground. In fact, he was quite open. And when people had issues or had problems in their life, he was able to get down to the real issues of their life. Because often what people are saying is not the real needs and the real things that are going on in their life. I love this passage in Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 to 19. Jesus says, To who can I compare this generation? They're like children singing in the marketplaces, calling out to each other. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. 
We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. What I'm saying is, the people in that culture were trying to get Jesus to live according to their script. And he was not going to dance their tune. He was not going to mourn on demand when they called for it. Verse 18. For John the Baptist came neither eating or drinking, and they say, he has a demon. So John, I mean, John had this holiness thing down pat. I mean, he didn't drink bad stuff. He ate really weird food. He lived in the dead. He was like your ultimate Old Testament prophet. In fact, some scholars would say that John the Baptist is the last of the Old Testament prophets. And he was, he was kind of like one of those, he, he, he was so different to everyone. And he preached a radical message, yet people still rejected him. They said, he's got a demon. And then Jesus comes along, a very different approach to John the Baptist. Verse 19, the son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. You see, Jesus, he wasn't pigeonholed as a religious uh, fundamentalist like John the Baptist. Jesus was pigeonholed as being a, a, a radical liberal. He's getting drunk. He's a glutton. Look at who he hangs out with. He hangs out with the people that are worthy of shame. Look at people that have committed fraud. Look at the people that are on the front pages of our newspapers. Look at the people that are publicly named and shamed for saying politically incorrect things. Jesus exposed himself with, to people like tax collectors that are within the culture worthy of shame. And so Jesus went to that other extreme that Jesus really, rather than cutting himself off from people, he really incarnated and lived amongst people that no other religious people were willing to go with. Yet at no point do we have any evidence in Scripture that he violated the Word of God or the law of God. The inter interesting thing about John the Baptist and Jesus, both of their different approaches to ministry, both of them were rejected by the majority of people. You know what that tells me about engaging culture? It doesn't matter how much you like Jesus. And it doesn't matter how much you like John the Baptist. You are never going to change a culture on your own. But God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can change individual hearts. And individual hearts can become groups of people, and groups of people can actually change communities, and communities that are changed can change the culture. You know, often I think we say, oh God, I want to change the culture. Well, maybe just be obedient to living out that incarnational life without violating your conscience. And maybe God will use you to touch someone and maybe that person will touch someone else. And maybe slowly but surely, the environment of a community or a family will change because that's God's heart. So what's the positive way? We don't want to become those people that cut ourselves off from the world. But we also don't want to become so much like our prevailing culture that we are no different. The best passage of how to do this, I think, is in Acts chapter 17. Let's read together. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Can you say greatly distressed? Have you ever been greatly distressed? Have you been greatly distressed when you... <laughs> have you been greatly distressed when you, when you see utter poverty? when you see people sleeping rough in the city, when you see injustice in our society. Um, I often say no, not many good things happen in Hindley Street after 11 p.m. If you walk down, you know, you just see people that are intoxicated. And um, I just want to go up, I just want to have a ministry of giving long shorts to young girls walking down the street. I wish I had money just to put all these seedy men in taxis and send them home with a nice long glass of water because I just look at it and I think sometimes I feel overwhelmed. When I, and there are things that distress me. When I see YouTube clips of hip-hop songs that have been watched by millions and millions of people that degrade women, 
and they call women the B word and they treat women like objects, like dogs. And I think, oh, I get distressed. Are there things that distress you in our culture? There, there are things that distress me. There are things that distress me that there are certain things that we can't, we, 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 we are told that we can't speak about um, God to young people, yet more and more young people believe that there's nothing more to their life than chance and randomness and that there's no greater purpose to your life. So if there is no greater purpose to life other than chance and randomness, then what argument do we have to say to young people, your life is worth something. You have intrinsic value and dignity and you are fearfully and wonderfully made and so preserve and keep and protect your life and do not end your life. So I sometimes get overwhelmed. Do you get overwhelmed? Paul was greatly distressed with what he saw in Athens. Verse 17. So where does he go first? He goes to church. He reasoned in the synagogue with both the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks as well. And then he goes to the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. And a couple of verses later, these philosophers invite him to a meeting at the Europagus with all of the, the great minds in Athens at the time. And Paul gets up and he says, People of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. For you are ignorant of the very things you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The first thing I want to say about this iconic and really important passage of how, not, not what not to do, because we don't want to be sectarian. We don't want to be um, into syncretism and just becoming exactly like our culture. We want to be disciples of Jesus that connect with people, but also show that we are different by the love of God. And God's grace has changed our lives. The first thing I want to say about this passage is, one, the importance of actually listening to people in the culture and actually seeing what's going on. Don't just point the finger. Don't be like the person that says, thank God I'm not like them. Get beside the young person. Get beside the person that is part of another religion. Get beside the person that has made a whole pile of different uh, lifestyle choices to you. Get beside the person that is addicted to drugs and actually try to listen to what's going on in their world. And God, in the process of you hearing their story and you understanding and growing in empathy, you will grow in love for that person. See what God's doing. You see, it's very easy. You know, like, we can laugh at Donald Trump. It's very easy for us as Australians to mock Americans, you know. Oh, ha, those Americans with Donald Trump. Ha, ha, ha. Thank God we would never have a, pro a prime minister like Donald Trump. Well, maybe one day we will. Clive Palmer. Um, but Donald Trump, that's not going to happen. But Donald Trump, sometimes we, we've got to stop putting ourselves on a platform and mocking people. And we've got to say, all right, so why are all these people supporting someone like Donald Trump? And the more offensive he gets, and the more minorities that he offends, the more his popularity goes up. I'll tell you, sometimes you've got to discern what's going on. It's because in America, it's obvious that people are angry. People are frustrated. People feel like that, that, that no one's listening to them and, and the political class have moved on past them. And so sometimes we have to ask the why question, not just the what question. Why are people angry? Why is that young person acting out? You know, uh, when, when I see a young person acting out, I always think, well, God, what's going on in their life? God, what are you doing in their life? God, what must be going on in that family? How can I pray for them? You see, if we want to be missionaries in our community, in our culture, we need to actually start listening to the voices that we disagree with. We need to stop clustering towards people that say what we, you know, on my Facebook feed, I can hear whole piles of stuff from Christians and it gets me really angry about what the government's doing or what this is doing or what that's doing. But it, it actually, if I just listen to people that agree with me, I never actually grow through from my worldview and I never critically examine it. Some of, you, some of us here, we read the same blogs, we, we, we read the same books, but from time to time, I think the Holy Spirit would say to us, will you listen to what I'm doing? Will you listen to the need in the community? 
Will you not become will you not become absorbed by the need, but will you be sensitive to the need so you can speak to the need? You see, I, th- I believe with culture, there's three reactions and, and ways that we can engage with culture. The first one is we can just receive it. You know, some people, if, you were, if you're an Amish person in this room, I'm sorry if I offend you, but I personally believe that we should be allowed to use microphones in church. I believe that there's nothing wrong with email and I believe that there's nothing intrinsically wrong with the internet. So I receive that as part of our culture. I don't spend a lot of time philosophically reflecting on it. I just have received that part of my culture. So there's some things that we can just receive. There are some things that we should reject. So some things we receive and we just say, well, this is just general truth. It's just helpful and we can use it. Some things we need to reject. It doesn't matter how culturally relevant it becomes. Pornography should be rejected by the followers of Jesus. There's, I, I cannot think of one good thing that comes from pornography. Drunkenness should be rejected. Revenge should be um, rejected. I meet so many Christians that believe that they are entitled to, to seek revenge. No. Revenge is not part of the Christian's tool book. Shaming people. This is the, 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 the media loves to shame people. There's nothing that we love more than a good old witch hunt. I mean... The thing that makes us feel morally superior is finding someone that's really bad and we just kick them many times. And we put them on the front page of the paper and we talk about outrage. There's an outrage industry. And what we do is when we mock people, when we, when we are outraged towards people, it takes our eyes off our own moral issues. And so we should reject the idea of shaming people because I don't see Jesus walking around shaming people. So there's some parts of our culture that should be received some should be rejected and some should be redeemed i think sexuality is one of these things it's not sexuality um a lot of things in our society can be used in good and in bad ways and i think a lot of christians have reacted so much against a lot of the talk and a lot of the commentary around sexuality that we extract ourselves from the conversation but really we should see sexuality as a gift from god where we can speak about the goodness of sexuality as a God created, um, as a God created thing. Um, musical genres. I, I think of hip hop. You know, so much hip hop culture. I can't stand. Honestly, I can't stand it. But so much of it, I love as well. And I think, isn't it wonderful that God is rising up men and women across the world to use this genre of music to speak life and hope and to speak about the value and dignity of women, not to belittle. And objectify women. So we can redeem culture by finding something that can be used for good and evil and making good out of it. That's what Christians have been doing. I mean, that's what we did with Christmas. Christmas was a pagan festival. And we said, let's make it into something about Jesus. Wouldn't that be awesome in other aspects of our culture to say, what would it mean to bring Jesus into this cult aspect of culture? Receive, reject redeem how do you how can you outwork this as a family or as uh, people you live with maybe just turn the ads down in the ads turn the music down in the ads and talk about what you're watching on tv have interactive tv watching and say okay so we just watched this scene what do you think was going on there what was true what was not true um i even do it sometimes i've, I've done it a couple times with my now five-year-old daughter she gets a bit annoyed because she's like dad i don't want to talk about it i just want to watch but, but I think we need to not just cut ourselves off from culture. We need to interpret culture through the culture of the cross. We need to interpret it. We need to take it on board. And, and you see, you know, I think a lot of Christians rail against, say, a Quentin Tarantino movie, which is kind of very artistic and kind of very abstract violence. But I would suggest that probably more harmful than a Quentin Tarantino movie for some adult Christians, is watching Home and Away uncritically. Because when we watch Home and Away, it's like the culture of Home and Away world washes over us. Or the culture of watching The Project on Channel 10, or the culture of watching, I don't know, whatever. Just a, just a kind of a, a romantic comedy. There's always messages that wash over us. And we need to say, okay, is this true? Is this false? 
What messages is this communicating? And I think that's something that we need to get better at as a Christian community. I think also we need to have a deep and robust faith. You see, the Apostle Paul, the first place he went was to the, 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 the synagogue because he wanted to debate and argue with people from his own world. And he wanted to convince them. He wanted to reason with them. And some of us, we don't like engaging with culture because we fear that we don't have enough knowledge. We don't, we don't have the right answers. And I've shared before about when I was a young person, it was really encountering Mormon missionaries that forced me to really study the Bible. And, and encountering Mormon missionaries really got me to start studying about apologetics and answers to the Christian faith and how it all fits together. And because um, if you are not confident in what you believe, you're going to become one of those people that just lives in the shadows and doesn't really want to tell people that you're a Christian. I think this passage also says, shares with us the importance of connecting your life with people that you meet in your everyday life. You see, um, the Apostle Paul had said that he shared with people in the marketplace. What I love about this is it's just saying that we can connect with people at work or in our neighborhood, just everyday people. Everyday people. And the question is not do you engage with people, but how effective are you being? How effective are you being? And I think, um, you know, for me, there's, there's a few places that I always try to have God conversations, just in my everyday life. And, and the hairdresser is one of them uh, that, I, that I just always try to have God conversations. And it's funny, often when I go to the hairdressers, it's the place I least feel like talking. I just feel like chilling. And I just don't feel like, but, but it's funny, it just, I'm often able to have conversations with people just in my everyday life. And it's not about preaching, it's just about sometimes sharing your story and hearing from theirs. What I find about hairdressers is they often like to share their story. I remember as a teenager going to the hairdresser and finding out all about this, my hairdresser, she was telling me about all these kind of her, her life and she told me all about her husband's affairs and all this sort of stuff. And I'm there as a teenager thinking, why are you telling me this? And um, so, so obviously she felt like she could share with me. Um, just the other day, someone who's here this morning, Mel Bartholomeus, just put this up on Facebook. I haven't asked for permission, but thank you, Mel, anyway. Um, just going about her life, I think she was at the Fringe Festival in the city, and she wrote this on Facebook. Last night, as I left the city, I met four lovely Indigenous ladies from Ernabella, and I gave them a lift back to where they were staying at Clemsic. Isn't that awesome? A young adult woman just saying, I want to bless some people that I don't know and give them a lift home. Why don't we put our hands together and just honour Mel? I reckon that's awesome. Anyway, the post goes on to say, um, when I told them that I'd been to, to where they were from with my church, I was met with huge hugs and heartfelt stories of great things people at my church had done in their lives. With high regard, they mentioned Alan Steele and Samuel Osborne. Oh, he speaks our language. Isn't that wonderful? When you learn the language of a people. Can I, can I say, imagine if Vagena went to a remote area of the Philippines and she got up and she, she moved into a three-story mansion and she was wearing all jewels and pearls and she stood on her balcony and she preached at the people about all the sins of their culture that they needed to change and she spoke in Australian English not trying to understand their culture or their language at all. Sometimes I think we think like that. We don't try to learn the language of people. Oh, he learned our language. Isn't that beautiful? Do you know, um, and, and do you know Rebecca, Norma, Uncle Bill and Jono? I said, yeah, and Jono, he's in Africa now. I visited him last August. Do you know Rebecca Matson? She's famous. She would visit my sister in hospital. I love that. You know, isn't this what true connecting with our culture is about? It's about learning their language and then going to them and visiting them in hospital and learning their stories and many other awesome people and stories. It was a really special moment. And I, looked, and I felt like they looked at me as though Jesus had just miraculously sent them yet another person from the Christian Family Center to help them out that night. Haha, ha, maybe he had. Isn't that awesome? You know, see, we say on our wall, we want to be a church for all people, but we have to acknowledge that people aren't just flocking in to this church. We have to go to them. And it's not about, 
you know, finding people that aren't there. It's about the way we engage with the people that are already there. The final thing about this passage that I love is it finishes with Paul saying, this God that you worship, this unknown God, I am going to proclaim to you who this God is. The thing I love about being a Christian is that we don't just give good advice. We get to proclaim. We don't get to proclaim our moral superiority. We don't get to proclaim that we've got it all together. We don't get to proclaim that we have all the answers. But we get to proclaim that God has done something in Jesus and it's good news for all people, no matter what they're going through. And so it doesn't matter what part of the story you hear about someone, whether they're in a ditch whether, they've just, whether they're on the top of the world, the gospel has something to speak about what God has done that connects with that person's story. And so, it, so that's the amazing thing, that Paul gets up there and he does not condemn them for all of their idolatry. He says, I can see that you are searching for something beyond yourself. When you see someone that's making mistakes in relationships, when you see someone that's making mistakes in substance abuse, when you see people that are caught up in themselves, but they will never, ever, ever find what they're looking for, don't point at them. Say, God, I believe that they are made for something more than themselves. And the gospel says that God has created for you for something more than yourself. That God has come to seek and save those that were lost. The gospel is not a reaction to culture. The gospel is good news about what God has done. We don't have to make it relevant. It's just about acknowledging that as we share the gospel to people and connect it with their story, it is relevant. I have never, ever met someone that didn't have Jesus that I've been jealous of their life. Because it doesn't matter if they've got all the gold in China. I look at their life and I think, you need Jesus. You need forgiveness. You know, Just um, this week, there was a a, a eulogy that's doing the rounds. Can I get the band up? It's doing the rounds on social media. It was on news.com.au. It was the eulogy of the Oklahoma NBA coach, Monty Williams. Has anyone seen it? Resounding response. See, this coach, he's, he's a man of God. He's got four, I think it's four daughters. And... He gave the eulogy at his wife's funeral because she got hit uh, by a car coming in the opposite direction. They crossed over the line, um, head-on collision, and she died. And um, a lot of the the, the players in games, they've been breaking down in tears after the games. And Monty Williams, it was on, uh, yeah, so secular news all across Fox Sports and news.com. And they're saying the most powerful speech you've ever heard I'm thinking, oh yeah, powerful, probably like a motivational speech, but I, I watched it. And this man got up and he basically said, my wife, I, I, I'm not grieving because I'm never going to see my wife again. I know that I'm going to see my wife again. And that's where she, where she is, that's where I want to be, and that's where I want you to be as well. And he talked about the cross, and he talked about Jesus, and he said, you know what? We're going to get through this because we believe that God works all things for good for those that love Him and accord according to His purpose. And then he said, but it's not just our family that's doing it tough. I want us to be thinking about the other family involved in this tragedy. And it was the other family that was at fault. I don't know the dynamics of their family. And he said, he said, and he spoke about forgiveness. And he spoke about wanting to bless them. And he spoke about harboring no hurt or no offense towards them and wanting to bless them and wanting to love them. And I thought, here is a man in a world where apparently you can't talk about Jesus, where you can't talk about the Christian gospel. He is a platform of millions of people across social media and people are lapping it up because they say, here is a man that is expressing forgiveness and love when he's at his lowest of low. And it breaks people's hearts because you know what? There's something about the gospel of good news and forgiveness of sins that liberates every human heart. And there's something about the human heart. Every movie that people watch, the the bits that get your heartstrings, it's the gospel moments. 
It's the redemption. It's the forgiveness. It's the overcoming evil aspects. There's something in the human DNA that is crying out for good news. And we have good news. Good news for all people. And so how dare we point the finger and feel we're better than other people. But also how dare we become like other people. And we lose the ability to share good news. Why don't we stand to our feet?